I'm going to go over the clinical significance of a biochemical failure. We'll review the literature regarding salvage and adjuvant radiotherapy. Go over consensus guidelines, and I'll ask the question rhetorically, do you concur with them? And then we'll go over meta-level um, considerations. And so just sort of the baseline statements that everybody knows. Um, prostatectomy, um, whatever the manifestation of it is, is an established treatment option for a uh, curative um, therapy for localized um, prostate cancer. Uh, we know it's the most common form of treatment employed for men with prostate cancer. And we know also that it tends to be used for gentlemen who are younger in age, so the ones um, who might, in fact, benefit the most from talking about post-operative um, radiotherapeutics. In general, minimally invasive surgery has gained traction over the last 10 years or so, um, with minimally invasive rates of surgery um, increasing over open approaches. And like any modality for prostate cancer, um, there are uh, treatment failures. So that's true whether it's radiation or surgery or whether, whether we're talking about a, a mastectomy even. In terms of post-operative um, results of biochemical uh, failure, um, it really depends on pretreatment factors. So depending on which of the series that's quoted, you're going to get a different rate of, of post-radical um, failure rates, but clearly having an increase in um, disease aggression uh, portends for decreased biochemical control. And men eventually over time with long-term follow-up will develop um, bony mastic disease in a decent proportion. If one looks at NCCN guidelines and, and tries to tease out gentlemen who have adverse pathologic features post-surgery, um, so those who have positive surgical margins, extracapsular extension, seminal vesicle invasion, um, there's the recommendation for either um, radiotherapy or for observation. And in the discussion section of NCCN, it, it'll say selecting men appropriately is actually difficult, which is sort of a, a funny thing to read in a manuscript section. Um, and we'll say observation is appropriate and then go over the um, consensus guideline statements of the AUA and ASTRO, which we'll discuss. And so what I think is interesting to start with is what's the clinical significance of biochemical failure and looking at that over a longitudinal period of time. And I think the best series that characterizes that came out of Johns Hopkins, it's published in JAMA um, roughly 20 years ago, which followed 2,000 men who had prostatectomy and they were followed. And at a mean follow-up of 5.3 years in this cohort, 15% of patients developed biochemical failure, and roughly a third of the patients with biochemical failure ended up developing bony metastatic disease. And I think these are the two pieces of information that are, are quite helpful. The median time from first PSA elevation to developing metastatic disease was eight years and the median time to death after bony metastatic disease was five years. So when we interpret the data on salvage radiation or adjuvant radiation and try to tease out, um, is there a benefit in longevity, you clearly need enough time to follow it. The factors that predicted for um, the probability and time to distant mass attack disease was a time to biochemical progression, the Gleason score, the doubling time. And in fact, in this uh, cohort, if the time to biochemical failure uh, was less than two years, if there was a higher grade disease and the PSA doubling time was short, the probability of having distant metastatic disease at five years was 65%. And the time interval to appearance of distant metastatic disease was predictive of time until death. So that's sort of, um, that makes sense. If one's looking at what portends for decreased biochemical control and, and adverse sequelae um, uh, after treatment, there are strata of extraprostatic disease. So sort of the first layer is having ECE or EPE. Uh, the next layer would be positive surgical margins. After that, having seminal vesicle invasion, SVI, and after that, lymph node positivity. This is a large series of men who are followed over time. And again, um, recurrence uh, rates do follow this strata of extra um, prostatic disease. And these are centers of excellence in the United States, WashU, Baylor, Hopkins, Cleveland Clinic. And again, if you're looking at what portends for um, an increase in recurrence, it follows this stepwise progression, ECE, positive margins, seminal vesicle invasion, and positive lymph nodes. And several post-operative nomograms exist. Um, these are sort of um, are, are well characterized in our field. And so the question always comes up in people who have these adverse features, is it better to treat them now or to treat them later? Um, with adjuvant radiotherapy, you're treating a relatively smaller number of cancer cells, and you're by definition going to over-treat a percentage of patients. 
the later approach, salvage, you're waiting and seeing. You're picking out those patients who may, meet, may need um, therapy the most, and by definition, you'll be treating a relatively larger number of cancer cells with pretty much the same dose that you're giving for the adjuvant um, group. With salvage radiation, you're selecting those patients who prove to need radiation. Um, you're gonna avoid treating those patients who would never theoretically have benefited. And so if a surgeon's looking at their radiation oncologist, they might sort of look and say, this is a far side cartoon, Bart you fool, you can't shoot first and ask questions later. And so that's what the urologist is saying to the radonc. In terms of the literature on salvage radiation um, therapy, um, the, the rates of biochemical control are, are quite modest. Again, you're, you're selecting for folks who have aggress aggressive disease, but these are centers of excellence demonstrating pretty um, modest, at best, biochemical control rates. This is a large series of 501 patients from five institutions with salvage radiation. And again, at four years, you have pretty modest biochemical control rates with, with um, salvage radiotherapy. This is a large series from 17 centers of 1,600 patients, and this is pure salvage. So those patients who had, adjuvant, uh, who had ADT were excluded, and the overall six-year progression-free survival with salvage radiation was only 32%. But it makes sense if you treat patients earlier, so with lower PSAs, you had a better progression-free survival. And certainly if you're giving salvage radiation for folks who have higher PSAs, you could predict, and we see this in our own clinical experience, um, these folks are, are gonna do worse. This is a retrospective review um, published in JAMA of 635 patients from Johns Hopkins showing that there's actually an improvement in prostate cancer specific survival with men who receive salvage radiation. Um, in this particular cohort, Ad, um, ADT did not benefit um, patients with prostate cancer specific survival, um, and this survival benefit was limited to men who have PSA doubling times that were extremely quick. This is a retrospective review from Duke University of 4,000 patients who had um, prostatectomy. 519 of them went on to receive salvage radiation, and it showed that salvage radiation decreased mortality for all patients, regardless of their um, doubling time. So in summary, salvage radiation improves biochemical control, distant METs, overall survival, and prostate cancer specific um, survival. And we know that early usage, so teasing out those patients with lower PSAs, appears to be most beneficial. Regarding adjuvant radiotherapy, this, this as, as folks know, is you take patients with high-risk features, which we mentioned, and you provide immediate radiation. Um, there are sev several non-randomized studies. Um, these are from centers of excellence also, and all of the retrospective studies on adjuvant radiation demonstrate an improvement in biochemical control and disease-free survival, and that's with five and 10-year follow-up, but they, they're not followed up with benefits in metastatic free survival or overall survival. This is the first randomized trial that was published, the ERTC trial, which randomized over 1,000 men who had ECE, SVI, or positive surgical margins to adjuvant radiotherapy or an observation arm, and patients obviously could receive salvage treatment. And it showed that the five-year biochemical progression-free survival favored, um, you can see the Kaplan-Meier curves, adjuvant radiation over observation. And this was also met by a five-year benefit in clinical progression-free survival. Um, local regional failures, as you would expect, were lower in the adjuvant arm over the observation arm. There were no grade four toxicities, and although there was a trend in, uh, that of adjuvant radiation having an increase in grade three toxicity, this was not statistically significant. A post hoc analysis tried to tease out which of these adverse features provided the most bang for your buck, the most benefit, and in the ERTC, it was patients who had positive surgical margins did the best, they benefited the most. With, a, with an update of, with a median follow-up of 10.6 years, adjuvant radiation improved 10-year biochemical progression-free survival still, um, decreased 10-year local regional recurrence, but again, no difference in, in overall survival or distant med or cost-specific survival. The German intergroup did a similar um, trial where they randomized 388 patients. This only included patients who had ECE or positive surgical margins. Again, same dose adjuvant radiation versus an observation arm. And similar results as the ERTC. At five years, there was improvement in biochemical control rates, um, low rates of toxicity, no, dis no difference at five years in distant metastatic disease. 
and with an update of 9.2 years, the biochemical control rates with 10-year um, f uh, outcome favored the adjuvant radiation arm. Again, no, distant, no difference in distant met-free survival or overall survival, and the toxicity rates were relatively low. I would, I would state that I think it's interesting, again, just to balance this data and, and the, the SWOG analysis, which will show, prove this, is that this may not be enough time to see the benefit, the natural history of, of prostate cancer over time. Um, the POUND trial did show, again, that data set that you need more time to see a, dis, a difference in survival. And so this is a SWOG analysis, which also is a randomized trial with all these adverse features, same dose of radiation. And it showed that with a median follow-up of 10.6 years, again, the adjuvant arm did better in terms of biochemical control and recurrence-free survival. Overall survival favored, but not statistically, um, the adjuvant radiotherapy arm. This is a key finding, which we'll um, talk about later. The freedom from hormonal therapy, which is important, um, favored the adjuvant arm. Proctitis, not surprisingly, um, was higher in the adjuvant um, radiation arm. And the conclusion, similar to the other trials that have been presented, is that adjuvant um, radiation decreased PSA and clinical recurrence by about half. In terms of patterns of failure, other than the um, pound data that I showed, I think this is the other take home in, in my opinion, which is that the predominant pattern of treatment failure is local. So these are patients who received adjuvant um, radiotherapy, and you could see it benefited both local control and as well as distant control. And so the patients who received adjuvant radiation had fewer rates of distant metastatic disease over time, regardless of PSA. And if, in a subgroup analysis of those who received salvage radiation, and again, we'll talk about this, this was not randomized between salvage and adjuvant, um, those who received adjuvant radiation and SWOG had improvements in PSA control rates compared to those who had salvage, um, regardless of PSA. At the 15-year update now, so again, taking into account the natural history of prostate cancer from that Pound article, now you actually do see a difference in overall survival and metastatic-free survival. So the median overall survival for those who had adjuvant radiation was 15.2 versus 13.3 years, and the number needed to treat to prevent one death with a follow-up of 12.6 years is 9.1 patients. So this data now becomes quantifiable. Metastatic-free survival also benefited those who received adjuvant radiation. In each of the pretreatment grouping, the hazard ratio was less than one, suggesting a benefit of adjuvant radiotherapy for, for everybody. There's no particular subset of patient who did not benefit from adjuvant radiation. And I think it's important to note these are patients who received very modest dosing in the 1980s of radiation and improved overall survival for all of the patients. And so there's an attempt to provide consensus guidelines. So I have here the NCCN guidelines and you know, essentially selecting men appropriately for adjuvant or salvage radiation is difficult. And so it's somewhat maddening for us as, as physicians and for patients to try to interpret guidelines like this. And so the AUA and ASTRO tried to make it easier. And so five years ago, they published consensus guidelines and guideline statement number three with the evidence strength at its highest is physicians should offer adjuvant radiation to patients with adverse pathologic features. Um, whether it should be administered is a, dis a decision best made in a multidisciplinary context, so we all know that. And sort of evidence grade C, guideline statement seven, is that physicians should offer salvage radiation if, those, um, have, uh, if patients have more advanced features. Um, and so ASCO afterwards presented their consensus statement where they in fact endorsed the guidelines of the AUA and ASTRO and they added their take on it, which is a qualifying statement, and I don't know how much this adds, that not all candidates for radiation adjuvantly or salvage have the same risk of recurrence or disease progression. And when I read this, it reminded me of the movie Catch Me If You Can. I don't know if you folks remember the scene, the way Leonardo DiCaprio in 1963 imagined as a charlatan how physicians act. They sort of say, I concur. Do you concur? Do you concur? And so you, you have ASCO, AUA, and ASTRO all sort of concurring. Patients re should receive adjuvant radiotherapy. And the question is, is there a discordance in actual practice? So this was a SEER analysis of 35,000 patients who had adverse features after prostatectomy showing that only 14.4% of these patients received a recommendation for adjuvant radiation. This is a larger series from the NCDB database, again, 2004, 2009, well after all these analyses have been published, of 50,000 patients showing that 
um, adjuvant radiation was only offered in less than 10% of patients with these features. This is a larger subset from the NCDB database. Again, to, this is modern era, 2005, 2011, showing way lower than 10% even um, were recommended for adjuvant radiation. I thought this was one of the more interesting um, studies. Um, this was a questionnaire that was sent out to 1,250 um, radiation oncologists and urologists. This came out of UCLA where they took a patient who had these high risk features and they asked radiation oncologists and urologists, you know, what do you prefer in the post-operative context? And not surprisingly, radiation oncologists tend to prefer adjuvant radiation or early, not really delayed. Urologists did not prefer, on average, adjuvant radiation. They preferred early, either early or delayed. Asking the loaded question to this group, is adjuvant radiation underutilized? Again, pretty loaded, because radiation oncologists almost universally will say, yes, it's, 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 it's uh, underutilized, whereas um, this, their surgical colleagues um, more often will say, nope, not underutilized. So in terms of meta-level considerations, the question is from a bird's eye view, is there a discordance between the data and guidelines that we have and clinical practice? And so without getting political, I enjoy this quote from a former US Senator, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. And so from a bird's eye view, the question really is, um, is there this discordance? And I would argue the data exists to support both arguments. And so the question becomes, are you truly a believer? And so from a meta-level perspective, it's important to remember these three randomized trials were not randomized trials between adjuvant and, and early salvage radiation. They were between adjuvant radiation and observation, and there were differences in radiation timing and differences in the diseases that, that were treated in the observation arm. So only 56% of the patients who had recurrence in the EURTC study were given salvage radiation. 40% of patients had clinical or local regional progression that were already present at, in, in these groups at the time of salvage radiation. There are two randomized trials that are now accruing that are teasing out adjuvant radiation versus early salvage, so the radicals and the RAVES trials, and this will help us better tease out truly the, the question of early salvage versus adjuvant radiation. In terms of retrospective series, again, it depends on if you're a believer or not. This is a multi-institutional series that, that was across seven um, tertiary referral centers, 510 patients who were followed who had either early salvage or adjuvant radiation, and there was no difference at eight years in metastatic free survival or overall survival. And this differs. This is a multi-institutional series that was published in JAMA in January of this year of over 1,500 patients that essentially showed everybody benefited with adjuvant radiation in this retrospective analysis compared to early salvage. So there was a benefit in biochemical control, freedom from metastatic disease, and overall survival. And in a similar um, large cohort of patients, there was a benefit in all of these outcomes other than overall survival, and that was published last year. Arguments for delaying radiation after um, surgery is to reduce toxicity and improve quality of life. And I have to say, as a radiation oncologist, this is something that we don't always think about, or at least I particularly did not. This is from a retrospective database of 2,190 patients who are treated with prostatectomy, followed by perhaps radiation. This is out of Europe, um, showing that in terms of erectile function recovery or urinary continence, Clearly, those patients who have post-operative radiation, they take a hit in both of these areas, but the timing of radiation did matter. So those who received adjuvant radiotherapy had much lower rates of erectile function recovery and much worse um, urinary continence. And, and I would say, um, doing a literature review, this, t this, this pans out on several different retrospective um, series. And so again, you have the urologist saying to the radiation oncologist, you can't shoot first and ask questions later. But if you are a believer, you would look at the SWOG data. So the SWOG, data, the SWOG analysis did do a health-related quality of life instrument to their patients. They took 217 patients and asked them these questions on quality of life parameters. And what they showed in this analysis is that patients who received post-op of radiation did have worse bowel function through two years, but then it plateaus. And they did have worse um, GU function throughout.
There was no difference in the SWOG health quality of life analysis, but I think the real take home was the global quality of life. It was initially worse for those patients who did receive postoperative radiation, but it improved over time and eventually it exceeded those patients who had, radi who had surgery alone. And again, you can remember one of the, the um, outcomes that was, was demonstrated was the freedom from hormonal therapy. And I think this, this sort of gets to that with those who receive adjuvant radiation. The arguments for delaying radiation after surgery also is the concept of potential overtreatment. So again, the concept that there's going to be a number of patients who will never go on to need radiotherapy, um, and we know prostate cancer does have a long natural history. Again, the question comes into what's the number needed to treat, and that's how most you know physicians do think. And so you could just graph it. So I thought this was an interesting way of graphing the concept of number needed to treat in areas that we would never argue about in the world of medicine. So we would never argue about putting a pediatric patient on who has acute otitis media on antibiotics. There's a number to treat there of seven. We would never argue about somebody who has coronary artery disease and giving them a statin to prevent death. But you need to treat 30 people for that. In the world of radiation oncology, we're well versed on the utilization of, of elderly women who have T1 ER positive breast cancer after um, lumpectomy and whether or not adjuvant radiation pre prevents an ipsilateral cancer occurrence. And the whole point of this is if you're a believer, you would look at that SWOG data and say the number to treat of 9.1 to prevent a death is actually quite modest. The other argument that can make is the, the concept of a philosophical inconsistency, inconsistency. And the way that I would argue this is the following. If we see a patient who has aggressive prostate cancer, they have Gleason 9 or the PSA is elevated or they have adverse clinical um, disease, we would never deign to say to that patient, you know, maybe active surveillance might be the way to go. But the argument is if you do surgery on one of these patients and they have Gleason 9 and you know that you're leaving behind disease, it's somewhat of a, a philosophically inconsistent statement to say, I'll now perform what's essentially active surveillance on you and I'll just watch this to manifest. The way oncologically you would look at this case is you're providing a glorified sort of debulking. There's other issues of how you define early salvage radiation. So is it the time from surgery, so you're allowing more functional improvement, or do you find er, or define early salvage radiation as pre-radiation pre PSA, so really focusing on allowing improvement in cancer control? And this will be borne out in, in these randomized trials. So the radicals and RAVES trial are actually defining early salvage differently, so this will be extremely informative for us as a, as a field. And so I would conclude by saying there, there is a possible middle ground where you could be a believer and sit at sort of the table with these sort of concurrent um, consensus statements. And one way of a middle ground may be in delaying radiation to allow for further recovery, but providing androgen deprivation. And so this is the GTUG study, which was published two years ago in Lancet, um, that, that uh, randomized gentlemen between salvage radiation and salvage plus six months of an LHRH agonist and demonstrated progression-free survival benefit with, with only six months of LHRH agonist um, in this context. And on subgroup analysis, it showed universal benefit. So clearly there was a benefit with salvage radiation receiving a short course of androgen deprivation. This was the long-term update on the NRG R2G 9601 where Bill Shipley developed the plan, um, delivered the plenary session at Astro. Um, this was a phase three double-blind randomized study of bicalutamide for two years versus control in the salvage context, demonstrating improvement in overall survival and metastatic free survival. Other middle ground approaches, Dr. Stock gave an incredible lecture on integrating molecular imaging. So the question is, can eventually we think about improving risk adapted approaches with these sort of um, technologies that are developing, as well as utilizing some of the genomic biomarkers that are existent. And so in conclusion, Prostatectomy is a fantastic first line treatment for prostate cancer and like any surgery, malignant cells can linger. We know that positive margins, ECE, SVI, all predict for local failure, again, in that strata of disease that I outlined. Radiation can reduce the risk of local failure. We have level one evidence that demonstrates adjuvant radiation improves overall survival with enough time. We know that adjuvant radiation and early salvage should be discussed with patients who have poor features, status post prostatectomy, and we eagerly await the prospective trials of early salvage versus adjuvant radiation um, to better tease out this question.
Thanks so much.